On August 4, 1981, Sylvia Quayle's life was cut short under mysterious circumstances. A loving sister and daughter, Sylvia Quayle was only 34 years old when she was found dead in her apartment in Cherry Hills Village with a white towel draped over her face. Despite an extensive investigation, the killer managed to elude law enforcement and the case went cold for years. And it seemed like it might never be solved. For over four decades, her brutal murder remained one of Colorado's most perplexing cold cases. What could be the motive behind this heinous act? How did the investigators finally solve the case? Today, we'll delve into the mysterious case of Sylvia Quayle, a 40-year-old cold case that was finally solved in 2021. But first, if you are new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, please consider clicking the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Today's case takes us to Cherry Hills Village, an affluent home rule municipality located in Arapahoe County, Colorado. It has a population of around 6,500 people and is known for its largest estates and luxury homes as well as its picturesque natural scenery. The city has a strong sense of community and offers a high quality of life to its residents with excellent schools, parks, and recreational activities. It is also home to the Cherry Hills Country Club, which has hosted several major golf tournaments over the years. It is here in this peaceful municipality that a horrific act took place in 1981. Sylvia Quayle, the eldest daughter of William and Mary Quayle, was born on September 23, 1946, in Cherry Hills Village. From a young age, Sylvia displayed a remarkable spirit with an infectious laugh that could brighten anyone's day. Her vivacious and friendly nature was admired by everyone in her community. She had a heart of gold and was always ready to lend a hand to anyone in need. Sylvia's love for her younger sister, Jo Quayle, knew no bounds. She cherished her little sister and showered her with affection and care. Sylvia's kindness and generosity were well known in her community. Her selflessness and willingness to help others without a second thought earned her the admiration and respect of all those who knew her. Sylvia Quayle was a woman of many talents. Her positivity and ambition were evident in all aspects of her life. Sylvia had a keen interest in history and architecture, which led her to pursue a career in the field after graduating from Englewood High School in 1964. Sylvia's passion for architecture ran deep in her veins, and she was fortunate to have an uncle, Wesley Quayle, who was one of the most renowned architects in the area. Sylvia would often spend hours poring over her uncle's various blueprints and designs, seeking inspiration for her own projects. Despite the societal norms of the time, Sylvia was not afraid to pursue her passions and ambitions. She was a trailblazer for women in the field of architecture, proving that with hard work and dedication, anything is possible. Through her positive attitude, kindness, and unbridled ambition, Sylvia Quayle left an indelible mark on those who knew her, and her legacy continues to inspire young women to follow their dreams and pursue their passions no matter what challenges they may face. Sylvia was a true multifaceted gem with an array of talents and passions that she pursued with determination and enthusiasm. Her love for creativity was evident in her hobbies, especially her pottery work, which left everyone in awe. Her friends and family couldn't get enough of her unique and charming pottery pieces, and it was always a treat to receive one as a gift. But amongst all her hobbies, cooking held a special place in her heart, and she didn't take it lightly. She even decided to turn her passion into a business venture and started her own wedding cake business called The Buttery, which was a huge hit among her clients. Her delicious and perfectly crafted cakes left everyone craving more. Despite being so fiercely independent, Sylvia never forgot the importance of family. She shared a close bond with her parents and younger sister Jo. Her infectious positivity and kind nature were a reflection of the loving family she had, and it was evident in the way she treated those around her. The bond between Sylvia Quayle and her parents was unbreakable, living only a few steps away from their daughter's home that was the 3800 block of South Ogden Street. William and Mary Quayle would begin their day with a warm cup of coffee and a loving conversation with their eldest child. Sylvia's parents were the most significant part of her life, and her personality had a positive impact on her family's daily routine. They couldn't imagine what horror was waiting for them. The Quayle family had no idea that August 3, 1981, would mark a tragic day that they would never forget. As they sat together for their regular morning coffee, be a promise to visit again the next morning. Sylvia left for work as usual, but little did anyone know that this would be the last time they would ever see her. That evening, Sylvia spoke to her sister on the phone. 
They laughed and chatted like they always did, not realizing that this would be their final conversation. The next morning on August 4th, Sylvia failed to show up at her parents' house for their usual morning coffee. Her parents grew worried knowing that Sylvia would never miss their daily ritual without informing them. They tried calling her landline, but there was no answer. William, Sylvia's father, now grew even more concerned and rushed to her house, which was only about 150 feet away. As he approached her house, William's heart raced with fear. He had a bad feeling that something was terribly wrong. Sadly, when he arrived, his worst fears turned into a dark reality. It was a day that the Quayle family would never forget. Upon his arrival, William was struck by an eerie silence that permeated the residence. As he approached the front door, he noticed with alarm that both the security screen door and the wooden entrance were flung wide open, beckoning him inside. As he cautiously stepped into the living room, a sense of foreboding settled over him like a heavy shroud, and then he saw her, Sylvia lying motionless on the ground, her form splayed out in an unnatural position. Her arms were raised above her head as if in a final desperate plea for help. It was a gruesome sight, one that William would never be able to erase from his memory. With a shaking hand, he reached out and pulled the white towel from Sylvia's face, obscuring the most vulnerable part of her body from view. It was a small gesture of respect for the daughter who meant the whole world to him, but in that moment, it felt like the only thing he could do. William with shaking hands called 911 for help at approximately 7.57 a.m. and officers Gerald Marquise and Jack Davoli from the Cherry Hills Village Police Department immediately responded to 3800 South Ogden Street. What they found was a chilling and gruesome sight. Detective Harry Whitman and Detective Sergeant Richard Krause also arrived to aid in the investigation. The crime scene was enough to make even the most seasoned police officers shudder in horror. The police department knew that they needed all the help they could get to solve this heinous crime. The Colorado Bureau of Investigation was called in to assist in the investigation and processing of the crime scene. The presence of experienced CBI agents such as Walt Chin, Wayne Bryant, and Howard Goldsby brought some hope that the perpetrator of this gruesome crime would be brought to justice. The crime scene was a chilling sight to behold. When the detectives stepped in, their eyes scanned every corner of the room. It was immediately apparent how the perpetrator had left the residence with both the security screen door and the front door wide open. The living room was in disarray with bloodstains evident on the floor. The blood seemed to be concentrated in certain areas, including near the front door and a few feet from Sylvia's lifeless body. As the detectives approached the body, they noticed a medium-sized kitchen knife with a silver blade covered in blood lying near her. To their surprise, they also found a white blouse-style shirt lying over the handle of the knife, possibly placed there by the killer. It was a scene straight out of a horror movie and the detectives knew they had a long and difficult road ahead of them in trying to solve this heinous crime. As Detective Whitman examined the interior of the scene, a chill ran down his spine. The sight of Sylvia's lifeless body lying on the floor with her red shirt covering her face was enough to make his stomach churn. But what caught his attention were the visible marks on Sylvia's body. Her hands covered in blood seemed to have fought for her life. The broken fingernails were a telltale sign of the struggle she must have put up. As he observed her neck, the marks on it appeared to be in the shape of fingers indicating that she had been strangled. The red marks on her inner thighs were a mystery that would need to be solved. In the bedroom, the blood-soaked pillow caught the detective's eye. The investigation was about to take a darker turn as they delved deeper into the evidence and the circumstances surrounding Sylvia Quayle's tragic death. The search for answers was just beginning and the Quayle family deserved justice for the unspeakable act that had taken away their beloved Sylvia. As detectives continued to gather evidence and interview potential witnesses, a clearer picture of Sylvia's final moments started to emerge. The timeline leading up to her death was crucial in understanding the sequence of events and identifying potential suspects. Sylvia's interactions, activities, and relationships were all scrutinized to uncover any possible motives for the crime. The chilling details of the investigation, along with the twists and turns that would eventually lead to the resolution of this cold case, were about to unfold. Join us in the next episode as we delve deeper into the mysterious case of Sylvia Quayle, exploring the evidence, suspects, and the ultimate breakthrough that brought justice to a 40-year-old cold case. If you found this episode intriguing, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Your support is crucial in bringing these stories to light. Stay tuned for the next episode as we unravel the mysteries that surround us.as he looked around, he noticed that the telephone cord was cut, severing any hope of Sylvia seeking help. It was evident that the killer had planned the attack meticulously and made sure that Sylvia was isolated and helpless. 
As Detective Whitman continued to examine the scene, a sense of dread washed over him. This was no ordinary crime. This was a horrific act that needed to be solved as soon as possible. When Detective Whitman examined the exterior of the residence, he couldn't help but notice the peculiar state of the stereo phone line that connected to the victim's house. It was carelessly yanked down and left draped across the hood of Sylvia's 1974 brown Corvette as if it were some macabre decoration. The investigation revealed that a garden hose was the culprit behind sabotage thrown over the line and ruthlessly tugged down, leaving behind telltale black marks. It was clear that the perpetrator was not one to shy away from employing makeshift tools to achieve their nefarious ends. The assailant also left behind evidence of multiple attempts to gain entry. Detectives noticed a small hole in the screen of a bedroom window, a sign of an unsuccessful attempt. However, the bathroom window was not so lucky. Its screen was missing and was later found hidden among some tall weeds 50 feet away from the home. The wooden frame showed signs of tampering with a pry mark on the bottom and it was discovered to have been left unlocked, making it an easy target for the intruder. After the examination of the crime scene, Sylvia's body was sent for an autopsy. The brutal murder of Sylvia Quayle left a gruesome trail of evidence after the autopsy which was conducted by Arapahoe County Coroner John Wood. The shocking truth about Sylvia's death was revealed. Sylvia had been shot in the head with a .22 caliber bullet, stabbed three times in her upper back, strangled, and likely also assaulted. Dr. Wood, a seasoned coroner, swabbed various parts of Sylvia's body to preserve any potential forensic evidence, including microscopic slides created from the swabs obtained from inside her body. In his report, Dr. Wood determined that Sylvia died due to exsanguination caused by laceration of the heart aorta and both lungs due to multiple stab wounds to the posterior chest. Additionally, he identified a gunshot wound to the head and removed two bullet fragments from Sylvia's brain. The subsequent autopsy report revealed the horrific nature of her final moments. It was a combination of a gunshot wound, multiple stab wounds, strangulation, and potential assault that took her life away. Without a doubt, Sylvia's death was the result of an extremely violent act committed by an unknown assailant. Dr. Wood listed the manner of death as a homicide, leaving law enforcement officials to work tirelessly to bring the perpetrator to justice. The case had all the hallmarks of a classic whodunit, with plenty of forensic evidence left behind to give investigators hope that they would soon apprehend the culprit. But as the days turned into weeks and then months, it became increasingly clear that this was no ordinary investigation. Despite their best efforts, the local police department was struggling to make headway, hindered by a lack of technology and the absence of any concrete leads. Even the smallest pieces of evidence seemed to lead nowhere. The unknown bodily fluid found at the scene was little more than a mystery with DNA technology still in its infancy in the early 1980s. Without a registered sex offender profile to work from, investigators were left scratching their heads, wondering how they were ever going to catch a break in the seemingly unsolvable case. The crime scene of Sylvia Quayle's murder was carefully examined by detectives who collected around 140 pieces of evidence. It wasn't until two years after the killing that a significant discovery was made. In 1983, forensic technicians used an alternate light source to reveal potential foreign material on the orange area rug, which was collected where Sylvia Quayle had taken her last breath. Through further analysis, the material was identified as semen. This discovery provided a crucial piece of evidence for the investigation and gave detectives a new direction to pursue in their quest for justice. The case of Sylvia's murder had been lying in a state of dormancy buried deep in the archives with little to no progress being made for years. However, a sudden glimmer of hope shone upon the investigators on the horizon in 1985 when Otis Elwood Toole, a notorious drifter and serial killer, confessed to her killing. He described in detail the surroundings of her home, trees, and hedges to the detective, raising hopes that justice would finally be served. However, doubt soon crept in about Toole's confessions, along with those of his companion, Henry Lee Lucas. Lucas, who died in a Texas prison in 2001, claimed responsibility for hundreds of murders, but authorities were only able to confirm a few. One of the most infamous crimes that Toole confessed to was the abduction and murder of Adam Walsh, the son of America's most wanted host John Walsh, in Hollywood, Florida. Despite Toole later retracting his confession to Adam's murder, years later, Hollywood police officials declared that they had closed the case, convinced that Tool was the culprit. Following this confession, investigators believed that he possibly could be the killer of Sylvia. 
However, in 1993, Bob Gallagher, the Arapahoe County District Attorney, dropped the charges against Toole. This was due to DNA testing on the evidence, which showed that Toole was not the source of the DNA found at the crime scene 12 years prior. It seemed like a sudden gust of wind had blown away the thin strand of hope that had kept Quayle's family and investigators going. The case went back to square one. In 1995, a piece of a carpet that was saved for future testing proved to be a crucial piece of evidence. The sample was sent to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation for testing. And five years later, in 2000, the results showed an unknown male DNA profile. Excitement grew as investigators plugged the profile into the FBI's combined DNA index system, CODES, but alas, no match was found. The case of Sylvia Quayle's murder had left the law enforcement department grappling for answers for many years. Every possible lead was pursued with utmost diligence and the latest technologies were implemented in the investigation, yet the case remained unsolved. Meanwhile, Sylvia's family anxiously waited for any news or updates on the case. Despite all their efforts, the mystery of Sylvia's murder remained shrouded in darkness for decades. After years of silence, a breakthrough was made in Sylvia Quayle's case. In 2019, Metro Denver Crime Stoppers teamed up with United Data Connect, a company founded by former Denver District Attorney Mitch Morrissey, specializing in genetic genealogy. They used this method that had already helped solve numerous cold cases across the country. This innovative technique was behind the identification of the notorious Golden State Killer in California. In January 2020, Cherry Hills Village cold case detectives and investigator Matt Hannigan from the 18th Judicial District Attorney's Office approached Crime Stoppers with renewed interest in the case. With advancements in technology, it was now possible to further the investigation using state-of-the-art familial DNA investigations. And so, after four months of dedicated work, on May 26, 2020, the company's tech had a name, David Dwayne Anderson. The discovery of Anderson's identity had brought a glimmer of hope for justice in Sylvia's case after so many years. The sleepy town of Kozad, Nebraska had no idea that one of its residents had been implicated in a brutal murder case dating back to 1981. David Dwayne Anderson, now 61 years old, had been leading a quiet and seemingly uneventful life in the small town with a sparse population. But little did anyone know that over 30 years ago, Anderson was living just a couple of miles away in Englewood when the tragic murder of 34-year-old Sylvia Quayle shook the Cherry Hills village community to its core. As investigators delved deeper into David Dwayne Anderson's past, a pattern of criminal behavior emerged. Anderson had committed at least eight burglaries in the years following Sylvia Quayle's murder, and in a couple of instances, he had worn gloves to prevent any fingerprints. This revelation only added to the mounting evidence against him. In one burglary, Anderson had even removed a window screen to gain access to the property, just like Sylvia's murderer had done. The pieces of the puzzle were beginning to fall into place, and it seemed increasingly likely that Anderson was the perpetrator. If found guilty of the murder, Anderson would be facing a lifetime in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years, the same penalty that was in effect when Sylvia was killed. However, under current state law, first-degree murder carries no possibility of parole. The stakes were high and the case against Anderson was becoming stronger by the day. On January 16, 2021, Robert Fuller, an investigator from United Data Connect, headed to COZAD to gather Peter's DNA without his knowledge. Fuller carefully monitored Anderson's movements from outside his apartment complex on January 18, 2021, when Anderson tossed two trash bags into a nearby dumpster. The bags contained 15 items that could hold Anderson's genetic material, which could provide the break detectives needed to solve the decades-old murder case. Detective Fuller's mission to collect DNA evidence from David Dwayne Anderson had proven to be a success. He had managed to retrieve several items from Anderson's trash bags, including an interesting assortment of beverages. The recovered items included a vanilla Coke can, a great value water bottle, a spiced rum bottle, and a Michelob Ultra beer bottle. With the items individually bagged as evidence, Fuller met with an investigator at a travel stop in Sterling, Colorado, and handed over the evidence for further analysis by the CBI. After a week of investigation on January 29, 2021, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation delivered a long-awaited report to detectives. 
the report revealed that a male DNA profile obtained from the vanilla coke and that had been confiscated from Anderson actually did match the DNA found on multiple items of evidence collected during Sylvia Quayle's homicide investigation. The DNA evidence was conclusive and it connected Anderson to the crime scene in ways that could not be refuted. Further tests of the collected evidence showed that Anderson's semen was found on the area rug of the crime scene as well as on swabs taken from Sylvia's body during her autopsy. Not only that, but Anderson's DNA was also detected on a swab taken from Sylvia's left breast. Shockingly, it was discovered that the white towel found over Sylvia's face contained a mixture of her blood and Anderson's semen, making it clear that he was the person responsible for Sylvia's brutal murder. After decades of carrying a dark and deadly secret, David Dwayne Anderson was finally arrested on February 10, 2021, in Nebraska for the murder of Sylvia Quayle. He willingly came back to Colorado to face charges of first-degree murder after deliberation and first-degree felony murder. The prosecutors on the case were determined to bring justice for Sylvia and ensure that Anderson would be held accountable for his actions. As the 18th Judicial District, Deputy District Attorney Grant Grosgebauer stated, The defendant carried with him a dark secret, a secret that was finally revealed during this trial. After all these years, the truth would finally be brought to light. After a long and arduous legal battle, Anderson, the man accused of murdering Sylvia Quayle more than 40 years ago, has been found guilty. The trial, which ended in a hung jury on March 20, 2022, was retried three months later, and the verdict was delivered on June 30, 2022. Anderson, now 62 years old, faced sentencing on August 4, 2022. The punishment he received will be in accordance with the law that was in effect at the time of the murder, which could result in a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 20 years. This verdict marks the end of a long and painful journey for Quayle's family and friends who have waited decades for justice to be served. After almost 40 years, justice was finally served for Sylvia Quayle, a victim of a brutal murder in Cherry Hills Village, Colorado. The founder of United Data Connect, Mitch Morrissey, expressed his sympathy for the Quayle family, particularly for her father who found her lifeless body. The disturbing details of the crime left him reeling as a father of a young woman himself. However, Sylvia's parents were not able to witness their daughter's killer being identified. William Quayle passed away in 1999 and Mary Quayle followed 10 years later. The loss of their daughter left a gaping hole in their hearts which could never be filled. Sylvia's family and friends always forever missed her vivacious personality and her unwavering love for those she held dear. The arrest of the suspect David Dwayne Anderson in Nebraska in February 2021 was a long-awaited development, and the subsequent trial was an easy one. Despite a hung jury in the first trial, the 18th Judicial District prosecutors persisted and finally secured a guilty verdict Anderson on both counts of first-degree murder after deliberation and felony murder. Deputy District Attorney Grant Grosgebauer spoke of the defendant's dark secret, which had remained hidden for over 40 years until the trial brought it to light. Chief Deputy District Attorney Chris Gallo expressed his gratitude for the investigators and forensic scientists who tirelessly worked on the case, refusing to let time deter them in their pursuit of justice. The verdict brought some sense of closure for Quayle's family who had been waiting for justice for over four decades. District Attorney John Kellner highlighted the significance of the case, showing that justice can prevail even after a long time. This verdict is a warning to any killer who thinks they got away with their crime. Justice may be delayed, but it will eventually catch up to them. After more than four decades, justice has finally been served thanks to the tireless efforts of law enforcement and forensic experts who refuse to give up on this case. However, it can't bring back Sylvia and her spirit that can brighten anyone's day. But it's a reminder for all killers that they can't be hidden in any shell and would always be found guilty of their heinous acts. What are your thoughts on this case? Share your opinions in the comments section below. On March 14, 1984, police were horrified when they found a young 27-year-old single mother, Sarah Mobley Hall, and her 10-year-old son, Derek, beaten and strangled to death in their apartment on Ventura Way, North Carolina. Sarah looked after children with special needs, including her own son. After nearly four decades of investigation, Sarah and Derek's family received closure in 2023. Who would want to kill Sarah and her young son who had special needs? How did the investigators find the culprit after all these years? Our case today takes us to Charlotte, the most populous city in North Carolina. 
It is located in the Piedmont region of Rolling Hills near the southern border of North Carolina, home to about 874,579 people. It hosts a friendly and vibrant community of people with different cultures. The mild temperate climate is one of the main reasons why residents decide to call Charlotte their home, offering a lower than average cost of living. Charlotte has something to offer to everyone, whether they are looking to raise a family, start a business venture, or just enjoy quality living. With its politically progressive and culturally rich community, Charlotte houses a large population of different ethnicities. Residents often like to refer to Charlotte as the beautiful city due to its magnificent natural beauty, abundant parks, and a stunning nightlife. Unfortunately, one fine spring day in 1984, something happened in this charming city that tarnished its beauty for almost 40 years to follow. Born to Mary Walker Mobley on May 1, 1956, Sarah Mobley Hall experienced a great loss in her childhood when her mother passed away after birthing Sarah's sister Mary and Mobley in 1958. After that, Sarah developed strong maternal instincts and she decided to dedicate a major part of her life to helping others. Although they were raised by their grandmother after their mother's demise, Sarah played a crucial role in the upbringing of her sister, Mary. Once she became an adult, Sarah worked as an educator's aide at St. Mark's School for the Handicapped. She had an amicable and gentle nature and was well-liked by everyone at her workplace and in her family. Then on September 3, 1973, a son was born to Sarah Mobley Hall and Albert Hall. Derek Dion Mobley was raised by his mother alone and was a student at Newell Elementary School. Sarah had devoted her life to taking care of her son who needed special attention and also other less fortunate kids who needed extra care. Sarah lived with her son on Ventura Way, North Charlotte, near the complex along Reagan Drive, which is now referred to as Somerset Apartments. Both of them were really close to each other. Derek was full of smiles and just as amiable as his mother, he seemed to share a special bond with Sarah. He also shared a friendly relationship with his Aunt Mary who used to visit them often. Since Sarah was a single mother, her sister used to help them out and spend time with them. No one knew that the young lives of Sarah and Derek would end so soon. March 14, 1984, was a spring day, and Charlotte residents were going about their lives as usual. On the same day, a few neighbors noticed a foul smell coming from Sarah's apartment. When they went to inspect the area, they found the door ajar. It raised the alarm for them, and they were quick to inform police about the incident. When the police arrived at the crime scene, they described it as truly horrific. Not only was Sarah a young lady and her little child brutally strangled using a phone cord, but Sarah had also been ruthlessly beaten. The bodies had been rotting for a few days before they were found by the neighbors. The crime scene pictures and the entire environment of their apartment looked deeply appalling. The police contacted Sarah's family to inform them about the brutal killings. Her sister, Mary, received the information through a phone call. She was completely heartbroken and blamed herself for not being there for her sister and nephew. She informed the police that she used to spend a lot of time with them in college and she used to work in the area near Sarah's house. The police chief Johnny Jennings and Mecklenburg Sheriff Gary McFadden tried securing all the available evidence, talked to every possible suspect, and investigated the neighborhood thoroughly but nothing of substance could be secured. Initially, the police had a few suspects in mind but none of them led the police anywhere. In the 80s, the police mostly relied on solid evidence against the culprit. Eyewitnesses, follow-up interrogations, and old-school detective work were the only options available for investigators to find the bad guys. Even after extensive investigation, the case went cold. Though different detectives reopened the case time and again, no new leads could be found. Police Chief Johnny Jennings reopened the case in 1998 and investigated the case further. DNA was new at that time. So after turning over every possible stone, he suspected that the pillowcase found at the crime scene on which Sarah's body was found to be resting on could have the DNA of the suspect. Unfortunately, the police database did not hold any matches at the time. Decades would go by and Sarah and Derek's family still remained oblivious as to who had taken their loved ones from them in such a cruel manner. After almost 39 years in 2023, technology had seen multidimensional development. After almost 40 years, the police gained a new tool in the form of genetic genealogy and DNA testing to provide justice to victims' families. The Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department received a grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance to allow the use of new DNA technology. 
In 2023, CMP Captain Joel McNeely sent some of the DNA found on the pillowcase to Forensics Innovative Labs, a company specializing in forensic genetic genealogy. The report was produced on the basis of records available in commercial databases. It did not lead the police to the killer, but it definitely laid out an easier path for them to tread upon. The report identified a match with a relative of the suspect. Then they partnered with the FBI to carry out a familial DNA search, making it the first ever case in North Carolina to use familial DNA technology to solve a murder. This finally revealed that the DNA found on the pillowcase was a direct match to a 61-year-old man named James Thomas Pratt. It seemed that just a year shy of four decades after their murder, Sarah and Derek could finally receive justice. James Pratt was born on April 14, 1962. He seemed to have lived a double life. While he was referred to as a good guy by people who knew him, he also had a number of minor misdemeanor reports against him. He was arrested a couple of times between the 1980s and 1990s. Even so, he was not linked with the double homicide of Sarah Mobley and Derek Mobley. The police did not even consider him a suspect in the 1984 case of Sarah and Derek due to them believing he had an insignificant relationship to the case and the victims. People who knew him found the news of his arrest deeply shocking. Glenn Counts, a veteran crime reporter of Channel 9, visited the Fort Mill Motel to discuss the news with the residents. They said that he was the guy who made sure that kids got in from school okay. James had also informed another resident that he was a church-going man. He was employed as a handyman in North Carolina for about two years. The resident stated that he was a good person who helped them with the installation of car batteries or checking on the kids, but there was a dark side to this good church-going man. His criminal history covered almost two decades. In 1982, he had a drug charge against him. Not long after, it finally dusted off in 1987. He was charged with a car break-in. Just a few years later, he was called in for assault and battery in 1991. It had hardly been a year before he was arrested for an assault on a female. This time, a decade went by until he was arrested for another assault case. These charges did not stay for a long time as they were quickly disposed of. But after almost 40 years, a solid case has been built against him. At the time of the murders of Sarah and Derek, James Pratt was 22 years old and lived in the neighborhood. What's more surprising, he was even friendly with them. So although the motive had not been identified, he was definitely the one who murdered a young single mother and her innocent son who had special needs. James Thomas Pratt was staying in a hotel in York County off Highway 21 near Caro in South Carolina on February 1, 2023 when the police reached the hotel and arrested him. He was cooperative according to the officers. He has been charged with two counts of first-degree murder and no bond has been provided to him. He was extradited and is currently being held at the Mecklenburg jail. The arrest of Pratt was a joint effort by CMPD's Homicide Unit, FBI, Charlotte Field Office, CMPD Cold Case Review Team, CMPD Crime Lab, Innovative Forensic Investigations, North Carolina State Crime Laboratory, York County Sheriff's Office Bureau of Justice Assistance Saki Funding, Parabon Nano Labs, and the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. After 39 years, everyone had forgotten Sarah and Derek except their family and the police department who were constantly looking for new leads. These four decades would have been enough to make a 61-year-old man believe that he had finally gotten away with murder. Thanks to the advancement in technology, justice has been served. Sarah and Derek's family received the news of Pratt's arrest by showing their gratitude to the police for not letting the culprit go. Mary, Sarah's sister, said, I carried a burden for years because I felt like I should have been with her. All these years, she believed that it would never have happened if she had been with her. She remembered Sarah having a jovial personality and Derek being a friendly child. Mary thanked everyone who helped her and her family find some answers and put this incident behind them. She added that the arrest of James Pratt had brought great relief to her. CMP Captain Joel McNeely said, There's a lot of bad people that have done a lot of bad things that are probably a little concerned right now. On June 26, 2001, just a day before her birthday, a 52-year-old Caucasian woman, Karen Moore, left her residence in Davie, Florida at 7 p.m. and would never return home. The next day, her eight-year-old daughter, Christina, would come home from summer camp for her mother's birthday, but her mother would not be there to pick her up. Thomas Stewart Moore and Olga Charlotte Moore were blessed with a baby girl on the 27th of June, 1948. They named her Karen Elizabeth Moore. She also had a sister named Pam. 
As she grew up, Karen enjoyed cooking, hiking, sailing, and playing the piano. Karen had a keen interest in traveling since her childhood. Nobody would have predicted that she would travel away one day and never come back. She completed her Associate of Art degree in 1968 and graduated as a Bachelor of Science majoring in nursing in 1979. In 2001, at the age of 53, Karen Elizabeth Moore was going through a divorce with her husband. She had a restraining order against him. They had an eight-year-old daughter together named Christina who Karen got full custody of. Before she went missing, Karen was employed as a nurse at the Edge Point Estates Retirement Community in Boca Raton. But even though she worked full-time, she never compromised on providing a quality childhood for Christy. She made sure to give Christina the best years of her life. Christina too remembers Karen as a dedicated mother. Despite her job as a nurse, Karen found time to take Christina to the zoo and do other activities with her, simply to spend quality time together. She wanted to ensure a happy and healthy childhood for her daughter. But soon, the happy picture of this family would turn into a sad story filled with a myriad of questions. June 27, 2001 was Karen's 53rd birthday. Christina came back home from her Girl Scout camp to celebrate with her mother, but Karen never came to pick her up. The first suspicion that something was wrong arose when Karen didn't show up. Karen was a nurse, so it was possible that she might have been busy at work. But Karen was always available for her daughter, and if she had work, she would have sent someone else to receive Christina. The fact that no one was there was very strange. As the day passed by, the story got even more mysterious. The previous day on June 26th, around 6.30 in the evening, Karen had paid her neighbor's son for mowing her lawn. That was the last time someone had seen her. She had then taken her white 1999 Saturn and left the house around 7 p.m. No one had any idea why she had left the house or where she could have gone. When she didn't return home, a police complaint was filed by Karen's sister Pam Kleiss. Pam revealed that Karen had called her estranged husband to pick up Christina before leaving for work in the morning the day she disappeared. Later, she had exchanged a brief interaction with her neighbor's son and then left the house. What happened after these incidents is anyone's guess. She was supposed to work the next day. Keith Creedall was the executive director of the retirement home Edge Point Estates where Karen worked as a nurse. He mentioned that Karen had a punctual and responsible working history of eight years. Karen was so sincere about her work that would have informed the establishment in case of any urgent endeavor she had. Everyone knew that Christina meant everything to her. There was no doubt that Karen didn't leave voluntarily. Now was this just a distressing accident or was something else at play here? With rising suspicions and no real leads, the police had limited resources to find Karen Moore. The first step was to track her vehicle. At the time of her bizarre disappearance, Karen was driving a white 1999 Saturn four-door with the license plate Duther. Her car also had an Indiana State University decal on the back. This information was distributed to the public with every possible detail. James Frankies, a detective at the Davie Police Department, received a tip from a woman saying she had seen the same car in South Miami-Dade County, but the information could not be verified or backed by any other witnesses. In a frantic effort to take the case forward, the police released a missing poster detailing Karen's physical appearance. The posters read that she had brown eyes, brown hair, and prescription glasses. Her height was listed as 5 feet 4 inches. With no success so far, the police were struggling for leads to find the whereabouts of Karen Moore. The initial inspection of her house was enough of an indicator to anticipate bad news. All her clothing, luggage, and even her cell phone were found at home. A closer look at her house made it evident that there were no signs of forced entry or foul play. The detective suspected that Karen must have left the house voluntarily. However, what caused her to leave was still unclear. Frank Eyes informed the public that the police were looking into the financial and telephone records of Karen Moore. The possibility of theft or robbery was immediately shunned when her bank account and credit card showed no activity. This also meant that Karen was in a bad state. After all, with all her necessary items still at home, she would have required cash to sustain herself. Her relatives requested the police department to search for Karen with a helicopter, but with no knowledge of the direction that Karen could have driven in, the police couldn't proceed further. The Moore family and the entire police department released missing person posters with rewards, but Karen had completely vanished without any trace. Days turned into months and months turned into years, and Karen's family was left waiting for her to come home. Years upon years went by, but Karen did not return. 
Her daughter Christina got married and had children of her own, but there was still no information about what had happened to Karen that day. January 6, 2023 was the day when Brian Lockhart, a scuba diver, and the owner of the YouTube channel Dead of History accompanied Michael Rodriguez and Mike Sullivan heading the Sunshine State Sonar team in searching the local water bodies in Broward County. With the help of advanced sonar technology, they found a car in a retention pond in DAV. Aye. When Michael noticed his underwater sonar system lighting up, the entire team was quick to identify that they had hit the wheels of a car in the water. It took them about 15 minutes to finally find the car. When Britton dove to examine it, he found an open trunk and a license plate under three feet of muck. They knew they had found something substantial, but they were not sure about its details and whether it was related to any old cases. Britton quickly rushed to contact the Davie Police Department. Even 22 years after Karen's strange disappearance, Davy police hadn't forgotten about her. When they arrived at the scene the next day, they had to send the divers back into the water. The car was pulled out of the water and was set for further inspection. The car matched the description of the vehicle Karen was driving when she disappeared. The license plate of Karen's car was found covered in dirt. It was a huge discovery in this 22-year-old case. The pieces were finally falling in place. They found two bones inside the car, which later confirmed that Karen Moore had been inside the car when it entered the lake. Finally, they found out what had happened to Karen Moore. Lockhart and Rodriguez could not talk about the specifics of the case even when the entire mission was telecasted live on YouTube. The police suspected foul play and prevented the search team and even the Moore family from giving interviews about the case. Though the details concerning what, how, whys are still under investigation. A daughter finally got closure about her mother's fate after 22 years. After Karen mysteriously disappeared, Christina was left in the care of her relatives. The comfort and closeness that felt with her mother could never be substituted. She faced constant ups and downs in her early years. She even ended up in foster care for a time. In times like these, she would miss her mother and pray that she would be found or return home to her. She said every life moment that every little girl hopes and dreams for, you know, to have their mother with them. My birthday's when I got engaged and married, now I have two kids. They don't get to know their grandmother. Undoubtedly, Christina Babbert was very close to her mother. Even after all these years, she took to TikTok in 2021, mentioning how she would have liked a little more time with her mother. After 22 long years, Christina finally got some information about her mother. Christina could not get all the answers that had bothered her for years, but she showed her gratitude to police and search teams as she finally got to bring Karen back home and lay her to rest in peace. A further probe into the case of Karen Moore's disappearance is active and ongoing. Davy police sent an email to Fox News Digital stating that they had a meeting with the detectives, but they could not comment on the case as might hinder the possible outcome of the investigation. After the discovery of her remains in the pond, the next set of urgent questions appeared. How did Karen end up in the pond? If the police's suspicions are right, what was the motive behind this crime? Who was responsible for the 22 years of agony for Christina and the whole Moore family? Now that Karen has returned home after 22 years, all hope is not lost in her case. The dedication of the police department and the technological advancement in sonar systems resulted in a partial success. The answers may seem blurry right now, but justice for Karen may be just around the corner. If anyone out there knows anything, do not hesitate to come forward as your information could be invaluable to unmask a decades-old mystery. In the quiet state of Kentucky, a mystery began on June 5, 1976, with the sudden disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Carol Sue Kleber. Her disappearance left her family and the entire community of Boone County in northern Kentucky devastated. For decades, her case remained unsolved despite some initial leads and suspects. But then, in a dramatic turn of events, investigators found DNA evidence, a crucial clue that could finally lead them to the killer. As detectives delved deeper into the case, the mystery started to unravel. So how did DNA help solve the case decades later, and how did the killer escape from the police for such a long time? A 46-year-old cold case that was solved in 2022. But first, if you are new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, please consider clicking the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Boone County is located in the northern part of the state of Kentucky in the United States. It is part of the Cincinnati Middletown Metropolitan Statistical Area and is home to the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport. 
The county has a population of around 133,000 people and is known for its natural beauty, parks, and outdoor recreational activities such as hiking, fishing, and golfing. The county seat is Burlington and the largest city is Florence. Boone County is also home to many businesses, including several Fortune 500 companies, making it a hub for commerce and industry in the region. In the small town of Fort Wright, Kentucky, a baby girl named Carol Sue Kleber was born on November 28, 1959. She was welcomed with open arms by her parents, Daniel Henry Kleber and Betty Jane Meek Reniker, and her older brother Thomas Kleber. Before her life was tragically cut short, Carol Sue Kleber was a vibrant and talented student at Dixie Heights High School. She was a valued member of the school's quartet, where her violin skills captivated audiences and earned her admiration from her peers. With her outgoing personality and friendly nature, Kleber was well-liked and popular among her classmates. The enigmatic nature of her personal history leaves many wondering who she was beyond the headlines. However, a glimpse into her personal life is provided by her elder brother, Thomas Kleber. He remembers her as a girl who found joy in life's simple pleasures. She was a gentle soul with a deep love for her family, with a laugh that could light up a room and a smile that could melt hearts. Kleber was known for her carefree spirit and infectious energy. She was a natural comedian, always cracking jokes and bringing joy to those around her. Her brother fondly remembers her as a ray of sunshine, someone who never let life's troubles bring her down and always looked for the silver lining. But little did she know that her happy existence would soon be ended. On the summer day that was June 5, 1976, as the county awakened in the early hours of the morning, a tragedy befell the community of Boone County, Kentucky. Dr. Gaineshugh, a respected dentist in Walton, a town about 17 miles away from Fort Wright, was making his way to work on that fateful morning. Little did he know that he was about to stumble upon a grim discovery. While driving down Chambers Road, a quiet stretch located in the heart of southern Boone County, his eyes were drawn to something unusual at the edge of the road. It was a body, lifeless and motionless, lying right next to a culvert that served as a drain pipe for rainwater. In a moment of panic and with a racing heart and trembling hands, Dr. Hewitt quickly dialed the number for the Kentucky State Police and reported the horrifying scene. Luckily for him, Trooper Jan Wooshner, who had also served with the Boone County Sheriff's Department, was at hand and was dispatched to the location to investigate. The detectives from the Walton State Police Department arrived at the crime scene and swiftly got to work carefully examining the body and the surrounding area. They found injuries on her body that suggested she had been attacked and strangled, leaving investigators to conclude that she had likely been killed elsewhere before being left at the scene. The investigation also uncovered evidence of a heinous assault, further emphasizing the sheer brutality of the crime. They were able to reach out to one of the family members of the victim and asked him to identify the body. Thomas Kleber, the brother of the victim, summoned the strength to identify his beloved sister, Carol Sue Kleber. However, what he saw was something that would haunt him for a lifetime. The brutal sight of his sister's battered and lifeless body was etched into his memory, causing him to live in a state of perpetual fear and agony for the next five decades. They combed the area around the crime scene looking for any signs of something unusual that may have occurred at the same time. Every stone was overturned. Every nook and cranny examined in a tireless effort to uncover any clues that could solve the puzzle of this heinous crime. The lifeless body of the victim was taken to the county medical examiner, who conducted a full autopsy. Tragically, the findings revealed that she had been strangled to death using brute force and also beaten with a tire iron, which caused severe damage to her head. The medical examiner also found evidence that she was assaulted, indicating a sinister motive behind the heinous act. After careful examination, the medical examiner ruled the cause of death asphyxia caused by manual strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. They also found some traces of DNA on her clothes, which at the time they could only test against any possible suspects. The evidence was preserved carefully with hopes that it would be useful in the future with the advancement of technology. The discovery of the body of Kleber was just the beginning of a mystery that would take investigators on a lengthy and perplexing journey. To crack the case, investigators started by reaching out to the people living in the vicinity, urging them to dig through their memories for any information that could lead to a breakthrough. They also talked to her family about any information that could lead them closer to the suspect. They learned that the previous day of June 4, 1976, was a warm summer morning that seemed like any other day for the Kleber family in Fort Wright, Kentucky. 
Their 16-year-old daughter, Carol Sue Kleber, had spent the day leisurely riding her bike around town, soaking up the sun and fresh air. Later in the evening, she left her house at 5.30 p.m. as she had plans to meet a friend for dinner at Zeno's Hyde Park restaurant. But as the sun began to set, a young man in a stylish Chevrolet Monte Carlo car accompanied Kleber to her home. According to a neighbor, the car was driven by a young man with sandy blonde hair who was slim and about six feet tall. The two chatted briefly before Kleber went inside her house and the young man waited outside the house for her. Minutes later, she emerged from her home, got into the man's car, and drove away. Nobody could have known that it would be the last time anyone would see her alive. Investigators tried to find information about people who owned these cars in the area, but despite their efforts and the initial leads, the investigation into the brutal murder of Carol Sue Kleber hit a dead end. Every angle was explored. Every possible motive was considered, but there was simply not enough evidence to piece together what had happened to Kleber on that fateful night. Despite their best efforts, the case eventually grew cold, leaving Kleber's family and friends desperate for answers and closure. After years of silence, a new spark of hope emerged in the investigation of Carol Sue Kleber's murder. In 2017, two cold case detectives from the Boone County Sheriff's Office, Coy Cox and Tina Adams, reignited the search for justice. Their determination led them to the original detective on the case, Jerry Keith, who had retired but never forgotten about Kleber's unsolved murder. Together, the three detectives delved back into the case, hoping to uncover new leads and bring closure to the case that had haunted them for so long. Cox and Adams started their search by looking into two suspects that Keith had identified earlier. The first suspect was a man who had previously stolen a car that matched the description of the one Kleber was last seen getting into. The detectives tracked down this man and questioned him extensively. However, he vehemently denied any involvement in Kleber's death and cooperated with the investigation, admitting to past wrongdoing but maintaining his innocence in Kleber's murder. Cox and Adams collected his DNA as part of the investigation and promised to eliminate him as a suspect if his DNA did not match the evidence found at the crime scene. After the DNA analysis, Cox and Adams made good on their promise and called the man to inform him that he had been cleared of suspicion in Kleber's murder. Despite his past misdeeds, he could finally put the case behind him and move on with his life, while Cox and Adams continued to search for the elusive killer. After exhausting all leads on their first suspect, the pair then decided to explore a new avenue of investigation. In 2020, they turned their attention to another individual who had committed a sexual assault in the nearby community just two years after Kleber's murder. In October 1978, his name was Michael Dean Tate. Cox delved into the archives in meticulous detail, piecing together the evidence, eventually identifying Tate as the perpetrator of the 1978 case. They found a crucial piece of evidence, a fingerprint on the victim's car, that linked Tate to the 1978 crime case on which Keith worked at that time. To clear their doubt, the investigators also contacted the victim of the October 1, 1978 crime. But to maintain her privacy, her identity wasn't released. She told them it was a dark and quiet night in the Park Hills on October 1, 1970 when she was brutally attacked in her own garage. As she stepped out of her car, a shadowy figure appeared out of nowhere and grabbed her from behind. What followed was a nightmare that lasted for two hours torture and unspeakable cruelty. With this breakthrough, Cox and Adams thought of Tate as a possible suspect in the Carol Sue Kleber case. Tate was known to travel to the area frequently for work in the 1970s and 1980s. But despite his criminal past and potential involvement in Kleber's murder, Tate denied any connection to her death. The detectives had high hopes of finally cracking the cold case. However, their hopes were dashed when the DNA found on Kleber's body did not match Tate's, and the court documents showed that Tate had been in Cincinnati in 1976. The detectives were once again back to square one, left to wonder if they would ever be able to bring closure to this decades-old mystery. The case that had remained unsolved for almost five decades finally saw a breakthrough when Cox and Adams reached out to Authoram Labs for assistance in September 2022. Authoram Labs, a genetic genealogy company, aids law enforcement agencies in their investigations by using DNA samples to find relatives of suspects. They sent the evidence to the lab after funding was secured for the testing of the evidence in collaboration with Season of Justice. It took less than two months, and on November 20, 2022, they received an answer from Autumn Labs. 
Through the DNA samples left by the killer, they identified a genetic link to Thomas Dunaway, who had already died in 1990 and had a child who grew up without knowing his father. The detectives traveled to meet Mr. Dunaway's child to collect DNA samples for comparison. The tests would prove to be the key to unlocking the identity of the murderer who had long eluded the law. It was a painstaking process, but through the use of cutting-edge technology and diligent detective work, the case was finally solved in December 2022. After almost 46 years, justice would finally be served for Carol Sue Kleber and her family. Despite the fact that the killer, Thomas W. Dunaway, who was 19 years old at the time of Kleber's murder, managed to evade justice for decades, the tireless efforts of the police did not go unrewarded. In their quest for answers, they were able to unearth crucial information about Dunaway's life and the atrocities he committed. Though it could not bring back the victim, their relentless pursuit of the truth shed light on a dark chapter of his past. Further evidence emerged that he lived in close proximity to DeVoe Park, where the young woman, Kleber, was spotted with a man who resembled Dunaway. The more they dug, the more incriminating evidence emerged. Thomas W. Dunaway was not just a one-time offender, he had been on a rampage for six months, committing crimes and then discarding the cars he had used to flee the scene. His criminal streak did not end with the murder of Carol Sue Kleber. He was also convicted of killing another person in Boone County just six months after Kleber's murder. Detective Coy Cox uncovered Dunaway's pattern of violence, which left a trail of destruction and despair in its wake. Although justice may not have been served for Kleber's murder, the police managed to bring to light the dangerous and deadly life of Thomas W. Dunaway. It was a dark December night in 1976 when 19-year-old Ronald Townsend was found lying on the ground riddled with bullets. For days later, he passed away, leaving behind a grieving family and a community in shock. But justice was served when Thomas Dunaway, the man responsible for Townsend's murder, was caught, confessed, and pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison, but unfortunately, the sentence did not last. Dunaway was released in 1984 after serving just seven and a half years behind bars, leaving many to wonder if justice was ever truly served. The gruesome murders of Carol Sue Kleber and Ronald Townsend had a startling similarity. Both were left in plain sight mere inches away from the road as if to taunt the public. Detective Coy Cox thought that it was as if the killer wanted to send a message. But as they dug deeper, they discovered something else about Dunaway. He was AWOL from the army when Townsend was killed. It was almost as if the law didn't apply to him and he could commit heinous crimes at will. Thomas W. Dunaway had enlisted in the army nine days after Kleber's murder and was stationed first at Fort Knox before being sent to Fort Carson, Colorado. But even the military could not keep him on the straight and narrow. Dunaway had a pattern of committing crimes, ditching the cars he'd driven at the time of those crimes and getting away with them. Thomas Dunaway's love for cars led detectives to his doorstep. In May 1976, Dunaway purchased a two-tone 1973 Chevrolet Monte Carlo and shortly after arriving at Fort Carson, he traded it for an orange Chevrolet Vega. However, the trade did not shield him from the prying eyes of the law enforcement agents. Detectives investigating Townsend's murder issued an attempt to locate Dunaway and his flashy orange Vega. It was a chase that would culminate in his arrest on Christmas Eve 1976 in South Carolina on charges of setting someone else's car on fire and possessing an illegal firearm. It seems that Dunaway had a penchant for trading cars like baseball cards. First, he swapped his Monte Carlo for an orange Chevrolet Vega as soon as he reached Fort Carson. Then he exchanged the Vega for an Impala which he was caught burning with a sawed-off shotgun in South Carolina. It's as if he saw cars as disposable, using them to carry out his despicable deeds and then discarding them like yesterday's trash. But thankfully, through the diligent work of investigators, they were able to follow Dunaway's trail of twisted transactions and bring his dark past to light. The mysterious connection between Dunaway and Kleber still leaves investigators confused. While their paths may have crossed during their formative years in the Erlinger Alsmere School District, it is unclear how they became acquaintances later in life. However, Detective Cox has unearthed a crucial clue, Kleber's fondness for Duval Park. It seems she was a social butterfly, flitting from one conversation to the next with ease, and it's possible that's how she came to know Dunaway. Perhaps fate led them to that leafy oasis and their paths intertwined as they shared stories, laughter, and the simple pleasures of a shared space. Despite the mystery surrounding their connection, one thing is certain, the park holds the key to unlocking their enigmatic bond, as Dunaway lived half a mile from the DeVoe Park where Kleber often rode her bike. 
As Detective Cox revealed the long-awaited truth about the murder, the tension in the room was palpable. Kleber's brother let out a sigh of relief finally able to find some closure after years of agonizing uncertainty. However, as the detective delivered the crushing blow, the perpetrator had died years ago in 1990 at the age of 33. The survivors were left to grapple with a devastating question, what does justice mean now? Thomas Kleber, the victim's brother, was left with a deep sense of regret, wishing he had the chance to confront the killer before his untimely demise. The truth had been uncovered, but the weight of the unanswered questions still lingered. Thomas Kleber never forgot the tragic death of his sister, a wound that refused to heal over the years. The pain was so profound that it affected not only him but his entire family, leaving behind a deep and lasting trauma. Despite the passage of time, the memories of that fateful day continued to haunt him, a constant reminder of the injustice that had been done. Looking back, Kleber wondered if seeking professional help would have helped him cope with the darkness that lingered deep within his soul. The terror of losing a loved one never truly leaves a person, as Thomas Kleber knows all too well. The memory of his sister's murder has haunted him for nearly 46 years, causing him to worry endlessly about the safety of his family. Even his son, Daniel, who is 28 years old, can attest to the impact the tragedy has had on their family. As his father would often call him late at night asking him to come home early or at least check in because he always had the fear of losing his son just like he lost his dear sister. But despite the lingering fear, there is a glimmer of reassurance for Thomas. He no longer has to worry about the police disturbing his sisters. Remains to obtain DNA evidence as detectives were able to exhume the body of the killer instead. While justice may not be fully served in this case, identifying the killer has given Thomas a small sense of closure. Detective Cox's latest move in the long-running investigation of Carol Sue Kleber's murder is a daring one. He has obtained a court order to exhume the body of her suspected killer who died in 1990 at the age of 33 to collect a DNA sample directly from him. This DNA will be entered into the combined DNA index to determine if he may have been involved in other unsolved crimes. Cox is determined to leave no stone unturned in his quest for justice, knowing that this step could reveal new leads and help bring closure to other victims' families. After almost 46 years, the family of Carol Ju Kleber finally received some closure. When Detective Cox informed her brother, Thomas Kleber, that the killer had been identified, Cox's eyes filled with tears as he described the moment. Thomas's body relaxed and a wave of relief washed over him. I have closure, he said, his voice audible and filled with emotion. While the killer can no longer be brought to justice, Boone County Commonwealth's attorney Lewis Kelly considers the case closed. For Thomas Kleber and his family, the knowledge of the killer's identity brings some measure of peace after years of uncertainty and pain. The tragic murder of Carol Sue Kleber haunted her family and the community for over four decades. Thanks to the persistence and dedication of Detective Coy Cox and his team, they finally identified the perpetrator as Thomas W. Dunaway, who already had a history of violence and crime. While justice may not have been served in the traditional sense, the revelation of Dunaway's identity brings a sense of closure and resolution to the case. This case reminds us of the tireless efforts of law enforcement to bring justice to victims and their families, even decades after the crime was committed. What are your thoughts on this case? Share your opinions in the comments section below. It was a dark, snowy night on February 3, 1972 when the Durham, a well-respected family in North Carolina, were brutally murdered in their own home. The case remained unsolved for over five decades, causing fear and unease in the community as people wondered who could have committed such a heinous crime. There are some mysteries in this world that seem to be shrouded in darkness, their secrets hidden away from prying eyes and curious minds. Finally, investigators were able to solve the triple homicide after more than 50 years in 2022. Could this case have been linked to organized crime? How were police able to solve this case? We'll delve into a case that remained unsolved for 50 long years until justice was finally served in 2022. But first, if you are new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, please consider clicking the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Today's case takes us to the beautiful city of Boone, North Carolina, which is a picturesque mountain town located in the northwest region of the state. Nestled in the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, it is a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts and nature lovers. Boone is home to the Appalachian State University, which brings a youthful energy to the town. 
Visitors can explore the charming downtown area, which is filled with unique shops, restaurants, and galleries. Outdoor activities abound in the area with opportunities for hiking, biking, skiing, and more. Boone's natural beauty, rich history, and vibrant culture make it a mesmerizing destination in North Carolina. Bryce Durham, the son of Koyem, Durham and Callie Devon Crab Durham was born on November 12, 1926, in the beautiful state of North Carolina. He was a man of many talents and experiences who lived a meaningful life. Bryce's siblings, Ralph Elder Ham and Gail Durham, were an important part of his life while growing up. He graduated from Appalachian State University with a degree in history and physical education in 1941 and went on to teach for a year at Pleasant School in Wilkes County after World War II. But his career path took a different turn and for six years before settling in Boone, Durham operated the Mount Area Auto Loan and Sales Finance Company. Before that, he was a part of the home finance company for 13 years, gaining valuable expertise in finance and business. Despite his varied professional background, Bruce Durham remained a loyal member of the Boone community until his tragic and untimely death in 1972. Virginia, born on October 24, 1927, was the daughter of Calvin M. Church and Virginia Lucnia Eller Church. She was one of five siblings and the other four were Winnie Levon Church Elliot, Doshea Church, Duffy Pierce, and Rena Masello Bungardner Walsh, who were all integral parts of her life as she grew up. In 1951, Bryce and Virginia got married and later that year, Virginia gave birth to a baby girl and they named their daughter Ginny Sue Durham. On May 2, 1953, they were blessed with a son and gave him the name Bobby Joe Durham. They were a loving and tight-knit family. Ginny Sue was later married to the love of her life, Troy Hall. Nestled in the mountainous terrain of Boone, North Carolina, the Durham family had found their heaven. After moving from Wilkes to Mount Erie, the family of three decided to start fresh and settled in Boone in 1969. Their residence, 187 Clyde Thompson Road, was perched atop a steep driveway just off the 105 bypass. Jeannie Sue Hall lived a mere four miles away with her husband. It was the perfect place for the Durhams away from the hustle and bustle of life. On the winter evening of February 3, 1972, in the sleepy town of Boone, North Carolina, the weather was unrelenting. The frigid air whipped through the trees, sending snowflakes swirling in a chaotic dance. The Durham family hunkered down in their home on Clyde Townend Road, seeking refuge from the biting cold. Bruce Durham, the owner of a Buick dealership, and his wife, Virginia, who was a librarian, had relocated to Boone from Mount Aries just a year prior. Their son, Bobby, was a freshman at Appalachian State University. The family was known for their hard work, their reserved nature, and their preference for solitude. However, as the wind howled outside, something sinister was brewing inside, a tragedy was about to unfold that would shake Boone to its core. Unbeknownst to the Durham family, their lives were about to change forever. On a snowy night on February 3, 1972, Bryce and Virginia Durham were at home with their son, Bobby, when a horrific tragedy struck them. The Hall family sat cozily in their split-level home at peace and content. But their peace was soon shattered by a phone call that sent shivers down their spines. Virginia Durham's panicked voice on the other end of the line conveyed the urgency of the situation, her voice trembling as she whispered to her son-in-law, Justin Troy Hall, about several intruders who had broken into her home. But before anyone could make sense of the call, the call ended abruptly, leaving Hall wondering if it was just a cruel prank. Despite Hall's doubts about the validity of the call, his wife, Ginny, was overcome with worry for her family's safety. They hurriedly made their way to the car, which stubbornly refused to start as the road up to the Durham house was treacherous. They couldn't make it on foot. Luckily, a neighbor and private detective, Cecil Small, agreed to drive them up there. Ginny remained in the car as Hall and their neighbor Cecil went inside. What they found inside the house was a scene of chaos. The house had been ransacked and the sound of running water filled the air. But as they made their way to the ground floor bathroom, the true horror of the situation was revealed. There in the cramped space lay the lifeless, fully clothed bodies of Bryce, Bobby, and Virginia Durham in the bathtub, their heads submerged and the water still running. The phone line had been ripped from the wall, leaving the house eerily silent. With no other options left, Hall called the authorities at around 11 p.m. from the neighbor's apartment to investigate the gruesome scene before them. In a matter of minutes, a flurry of law enforcement officers arrived, their flashing lights piercing through the dark of the snowy night. As investigators stepped into the Durham home, their eyes scanned the once-tidy interior that now looked like a tornado had ripped through it. 
Drawers were pulled out, clothing was strewn across the floor, and pictures hung at odd angles or lay shattered on the ground. Closets had been ransacked, and the furniture was knocked over as if the perpetrators had been searching for something in a frenzied state. The officer's eyes then fell on the torn sofa set where the Durhams had been peacefully enjoying a late-night snack and their favorite TV show. The sight of the chaos and violence left a heavy feeling in the pit of their stomachs as they knew they were in for a long and grueling investigation. The television still flickered, with three half-filled glasses and plates of partially eaten food left abandoned on a coffee table. Further, they noticed something peculiar on the kitchen table, a half-eaten baked chicken, which indicated that the crime happened while the Durhams were enjoying their meal together. At first, it appeared to be a simple robbery gone wrong, but the presence of untouched valuables raised suspicions. A money bag bulging with cash sat undisturbed, a testament to the fact that robbery was not the motive behind the heinous crime. The agents from the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation knew they had to act fast. They carefully transported the bodies to Chapel Hill for an autopsy. The results were grim, but not surprising. Dr. Paige Hudson, the state medical examiner, confirmed the cause of the Durham family's death. Virginia died of strangulation while the two men had been strangled and drowned. As the investigation into the Durham family murders began, agents from the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation descended upon the Durham residents determined to uncover the truth behind the brutal murders. With precision and determination, they combed through every inch of the house, carefully cataloging every clue and piece of evidence they found. As the investigation deepened, the team grew, swelling to seven or eight agents by Saturday morning, but that was only the beginning. To unlock the secrets of the crime, they called upon the expertise of two top physicists from the state crime laboratory who arrived in Boone late Saturday night to join the hunt for answers. For hours, they pored over the evidence, piecing together the clues and working tirelessly to unravel the mystery of the Durham murders. As the investigation proceeded, witnesses came forward with vital information. One eyewitness reported seeing a green and white SUV leaving the Durham residence just after 10.30 p.m. that fateful night. But the vehicle disappeared in seconds. The North Carolina Highway Patrol launched a search for the SUV and found it abandoned on the side of the road a few miles away. The engine was still running, windshield wipers slapping against the snow and doors firmly closed. The investigators realized that the killers had used the SUV as their escape car. It was later discovered that Bryce Durham had taken the SUV from his dealership to get home in treacherous weather conditions. As the police searched the car, they discovered a bag of silver, presumably taken from the Durham residence. This crucial clue gave investigators hope that it would lead them to the perpetrators of this heinous crime. The investigation into the Durham murders was a challenging journey through the murky waters of suspicion and speculation. The list of possible suspects was long and winding, with multiple twists and turns along the way. Justin Troy Hall, the estranged son-in-law of Bryson and Virginia Durham, was among those scrutinized by authorities. A group of men from Asheville also came under the microscope, arrested and charged in connection with the killings only to be set free due to a lack of evidence. Rumors and whispers of a contract killing hung heavy in the air, fueled by the precision of the knots used to bind the victims. As the years rolled by, leads became cold. The Watauga County Sheriff's Department, Boone Police Department, and North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation toiled tirelessly, yet the trail grew colder with each passing day. It seemed as though the answer to this brutal crime would forever remain a mystery. For over 45 years, the Durham triple murder case remained an unsolved mystery with leads drying up and investigators struggling to piece together the clues. But in 2019, a glimmer of hope emerged after a conversation between a man named Shane Burt and a sheriff's deputy in Georgia. Shane Burt was the son of a suspected killer, Billy Sunday, who died in prison in 2017 while serving a life sentence for three murders committed in the 1970s. Shane Burt was helping with research for an upcoming book by Phil Hudgens when he shared a shocking story his father had once told him during a prison visit, a story of murder and mayhem that took place in the snowy mountains of North Carolina. According to Burt, his father had admitted to killing three people during a heavy snowstorm and had narrowly avoided capture. The news sent shockwaves through the White County Sheriff's Office, which immediately reached out to their counterparts in the Watauga County Sheriff's Office to share the information. This conversation led to a renewed investigation into the Durham murders case and brought new hope for justice for the victims and their families. The wheels of justice never stopped turning, and in the case of the Durham murders, they turned slowly but towards the truth.
With new leads to follow, investigators wasted no time in tracking down Billy Wayne Davis, a known associate of Billy Burt who was already serving a life sentence in Georgia for his previous crimes. The Sheriff's Department conducted three separate sessions in September 2019, October 2020, and August 2021, spanning two years, each one with a crucial piece of the puzzle in determining who was responsible for the heinous crimes. It was the corroboration of evidence from these interviews as well as from two other sources that finally led to the revelation of the truth. Through meticulous evidence gathering and careful cross-referencing, the investigators were able to piece together a shocking connection to a case from across state lines. The Fleming case of 1973 involved a network known as the Dixie Mafia, a loosely organized network of criminals that had terrorized the Southeast with their violent crimes in the 60s and 70s. This case had similar circumstances to the Durham murders and names began to surface that linked the two together. According to officials, Billy Wayne Davis, who is 81 years old and a resident of a correctional facility in Augusta, Georgia, is the only surviving member of the notorious Dixie Mafia. He is currently serving a life sentence for murder at the Augusta State Medical Prison in Georgia and has been in prison since 1986. According to investigators, he revealed details about a hired hit in the North Carolina mountains that went awry during a heavy snowstorm. Davis admitted to acting as the group's getaway driver during the Durham family murders, claiming that it was the other three men, Billy Sunday Burt, Bobby Jean Gaddis, and Charles David Reed, who entered the house that fateful night. Davis refused to reveal any other information about them. Despite the breakthrough in the Durham family murder case in 2022, justice may never be fully served. With three of the four suspects already deceased, charges are not expected to be filed for the killings. The fourth suspect, 81-year-old Billy Wayne Davis, is currently serving a life sentence in a Georgia prison and he is not expected to see freedom anytime soon. The idea of justice being served may be nothing more than a mere fantasy for the victims' families who have waited for five long decades for answers. The tragedy of this cold case is compounded by the fact that the identities of those who ordered the hit remain unknown. For the surviving family members, the lingering question of why their loved ones were targeted may haunt them forever. Special Agent in Charge for the Northwestern District, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Chris Laws, praised the diligent work of all the professionals and community members who have contributed their efforts to the case over the years. Jenny Durham, the sole surviving member of the Durham family, was full of gratitude as she expressed her appreciation in the press conference held in 2022. To the dedicated individuals who worked tirelessly to solve her family's 50-year-old cold case, she acknowledged the progress made by these investigators who spent countless days and weekends solving the case. Ginny Durham was especially grateful to Lynn Hagman, the sheriff of Watauga County, who remained committed to bringing closure to her family. She also expressed her gratitude to Wade Colvard, a special agent with the State Bureau of Investigation, Carolyn Johnson, Captain of Investigations for Watauga County Sheriff's Office, and Charles Whitman, a retired FBI special agent who continued to work on the case even after retirement. For Jenny Durham, their unwavering dedication and friendship meant the world to her, and it gave her hope in the midst of difficult years. It's a testament to the human spirit's power to persevere, even in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Watauga County Sheriff Lynn Hagman also extends his thanks to all the agencies, law enforcement officials, investigators, and agents who have worked on the case for decades. The resolution of the Durham case was a much-needed turning point for those affected by the tragic events of 1972. The Watauga County Sheriff's Office acknowledges the numerous individuals who have played a role in bringing the case to a close and expresses their appreciation for the efforts of everyone who helped find answers for the Durham family. For Rufus Edmonston, former North Carolina Attorney General, it became a personal preoccupation. He met with Rice Durham's mother, who had begged him to find the killers, and it broke his heart to see her die without finding closure. I didn't want to let her down, he said. It was the mystery of the mountains for years and years, and Edmonston was frustrated he couldn't solve it himself. But now, thanks to the tireless work of Sheriff Hagman and his team, the case has been solved. For Edmonston, it was a great relief, and he expresses his gratitude to the investigators who made it happen. The son of one of the perpetrators, Shane Burt, wants to apologize to every single victim of his father, Billy Sunday Burt. Despite his father being a murderous man who killed dozens of people, Shane is not trying to cover up his heinous acts. Instead, he wants to provide closure to as many people as he can. 
The case may have taken 50 years to be solved, but everyone involved showed dedication and commitment to justice, which is a testament to their perseverance. Despite the lack of closure, the fact that the case has been solved after 50 years brings some measure of relief and the hope that future generations will be able to rest easy, knowing that justice has prevailed, even if only partially. We hope that you've enjoyed this gripping story of how this cold case was solved after 50 years. The Durham family can finally find peace and closure after over four decades of waiting. Thanks to the hard work and dedication of law enforcement officials, investigators, and community members, justice has been served. The persistence and commitment of those involved in this case remind us that it is never too late to seek the truth and find answers. What are your thoughts on this case? Were you impressed by the way it was finally solved? Share your opinions in the comments section below. On February 27, 2011, a murder occurred in Hyannis, a village located on the southern coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. 31-year-old Todd Lampley was shot dead through the window of his room. Some shocking evidence found at the crime scene connected fictional stories to the murder. Despite this confusing evidence, it took 12 years to reveal the truth behind Todd's murder. Nestled on the southern coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, is Hyannis, a picturesque city. It is a charming gem that sparkles with history, natural beauty, and endless activities. The village is surrounded by the serene waters of the Nantucket Sound, providing stunning views of the sunset and plenty of opportunities for water sports enthusiasts. The quaint main street of Hyannis is dotted with colorful boutiques, art galleries, and restaurants that offer mouth-watering local seafood. For history buffs, the John F. Kennedy Hyannis Museum showcases the life and times of the 35th President of the United States, who loved spending summers in Hyannis. In addition to its cultural offerings, Hyannis boasts pristine beaches that offer a relaxing respite from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. This is where our case begins today. The night was quiet and peaceful on February 27, 2011, with a gentle breeze blowing through the streets of Hyannis, Massachusetts. But little did anyone know that a heinous crime was about to shatter the tranquility of the neighborhood. Todd Lambert, a young father and a beloved member of the community, was about to meet his untimely demise. As the night wore on, a concerned neighbor went to check on Todd. But as he approached Todd's house, he noticed something was off. The door was locked from the inside. The neighbor's suspicions were raised and he quickly contacted the authorities. When they arrived, what they found was a scene of horror. Todd Lambert, only 31 years old, lay lifeless in his bedroom with a gunshot wound that had come through his window. The whole of Hyannis was in shock. How could such a thing happen in their peaceful community? The investigation that followed would uncover secrets, lies, and unexpected twists that would leave everyone reeling. The investigators arrived at the address provided by Todd's neighbor, their hearts racing with anticipation and fear. They could only imagine the worst-case scenario, but nothing could have prepared them for what they saw. Todd's lifeless body lay on the floor and blood was splattered all over the room. It was a gruesome sight. As they examined the crime scene, the investigators' shock turned into curiosity as they began to uncover the evidence. Three shell casings and a black cell phone were found at the crime scene. It was obvious that Todd was mercilessly gunned down from the outside of his window. The investigators were left puzzled and with hundreds of questions racing through their minds. They combed the area around Todd's house, determined to uncover any clues that could lead them to the killer. No stone was left unturned. No lead left unexplored. The investigators knew that the key to solving the case lay in the details. So they went door to door, interviewing every resident in the area, looking for anyone who had heard or seen anything out of the ordinary on the night of the murder. They listened intently as people shared their stories, piecing together a timeline of events that would help them solve the case. The murder of Todd Lampley took a bizarre turn when investigators discovered an unlikely object at the crime scene. It was a sweet potato which appeared to have been used as a silencer muffling the sound of the gunshots. It was as if the perpetrator was taking inspiration from a hit HBO series, The Wire. In the gritty urban landscape of The Wire, a tragic scene unfolds in season one as a woman is ruthlessly gunned down in her own home. The shooter lurking outside her window in the darkness taps on the glass to lure her closer before unleashing a fatal shot. This chilling scene echoes the real-life murder of Todd Lampley, who was also shot through his bedroom window on a fateful night in Hyannis, Massachusetts. But that's not the only way the HBO show influenced the murder. 
Apparently, in season four of the same show, one of the fictional police investigators solves a murder in which the shooter used a potato as a makeshift silencer when fatally shooting his victim. The similarities between this tragedy and the world of The Wire are eerie and haunting, a testament to the show's unflinching portrayal of life on the streets, where a similar trick was used to mask a gunshot. The potato was carefully carved to create a hole in the center and placed over the barrel of a gun, muffling the sound of the shot that killed Lampley. To add to the intrigue, the cell phone found at the scene of the shooting was registered under the name of one of the show's characters, Marlo Stanford. The connection between the show and the crime scene was puzzling, to say the least. Investigators sent the sweet potato for testing and discovered DNA evidence on it as a crucial clue that could lead them to the killer. However, it would be years before investigators could connect someone with this DNA. But even then, investigators had another trail to follow. A handgun believed to be the murder weapon was later found to have been tossed into a nearby lake. It was later fished out by civilians and was then retrieved by the police. Luckily, detectives had another lead in their investigation at this point. Duverus Hampton, a man with a troubled past and a prolonged criminal record, was wearing a GPS monitor bracelet around the killing as part of his probation in an unrelated case. Location data on Hampton's GPS monitoring bracelet placed him at the exact location where the gun was thrown into the lake. Phone records revealed that Hampton had exchanged a series of calls and texts with a man who was present in Lampley's house at the time of the murder, but the biggest link was yet to be revealed. Detectives discovered that the suspect, Diverus Hampton, had a previous connection with the victim, Todd Lampley. Hampton testified in court that Lampley was involved in the July 2007 murder of Jacques Sellers in the same neighborhood. Interestingly, Jacques was also murdered in the same manner, a gunshot through the window. It's as if Hampton was leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for investigators to follow. With every lead pointing to him, it was only a matter of time before justice was served. The web of lies and deception that Hampton had spun around himself was slowly unraveling. Yet he remained tight-lipped and refused to answer anything about the Todd Lampley case during questioning after getting arrested in an unrelated case just a few days after the shooting. It was a frustrating roadblock, but the investigators didn't give up. They were determined to get to the bottom of the case no matter what it took. Years of painstaking work finally paid off when DNA evidence connected the murder to Hampton. In 2016, authorities obtained a DNA swab from Hampton without his knowledge by collecting some of his phlegm that he spit into a puddle. When the results came back, they were conclusive. The DNA on the sweet potato matched that of Hampton's spit. It was a breakthrough moment in the case. The puzzle was finally coming together. But despite this damning evidence, it still took seven years to finally apprehend Diverse Hampton. On February 24, 2023, now 40-year-old Hampton was taken into custody and charged with one count each of murder and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon for the fatal shooting of 31-year-old Todd Lambert. Authorities, however, declined to comment on what caused the delay. In a courtroom filled with tension and uncertainty, Hampton made his first appearance before a judge in Barnes District Court on February 27, 2023, exactly 12 years after the fatal shooting. With a stern expression on his face, he firmly declared his innocence by pleading not guilty to the charges against him. Despite the gravity of the situation, Hampton remained composed and resolute, knowing that the legal battle ahead of him would be a long and arduous one. The courtroom fell silent as the judge set his next court date for April 5, 2023. The case of Todd Lambert's murder might have come to a conclusion and the suspect has been identified, but the investigation is far from finished. Assistant District Attorney Russell Ines has remained tight-lipped about the delay in the case, only stating that the evidence has been assessed. Meanwhile, Hampton's court-appointed attorney, Edward Fogarty, has promised a vigorous defense and expressed confidence in his client's innocence.